Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Ishita Trivedi, and I am a PhD candidate at NC State University and the ANS Student Conference Organizing Committee Chair. Before I get started into today's session, I want to extend my best wishes um, to all of you and your family, and I hope that you are all safe, healthy, and well-stocked as we navigate through this difficult time. As you may know, the ANS 2020 Student Conference has been postponed to April 2021 in light of COVID-19 pandemic. So we decided that it would be a good idea to bring you a new initiative, which is a three-part ANS Student Conference webinar series. Dr. Barenwall kicked off this webinar last week with a plenary session, and today we will continue into part two of the webinar by bringing you one of our most popular panels of the student conference on nuclear economics. This panel features various speakers, including Harsh Desai from Nuclear Energy Institute, Scott Rasmussen from New Scale Power, and Eric Lowen from GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy. The discussion will focus on economics of nuclear power with topics including economic drivers for current nuclear power plants and what will be needed for bringing new plants online. Uh, it is wonderful to see such a great turnout for this webinar. We had over 1,000 signups, um, so no pressure. But I request that with that, if you have any questions, please ask them using the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, uh, with that, first, let me take a moment to recognize Catherine Pratt, who works at Westinghouse Electric Company and is the vice chair and chair elect for Young Members Group, and Matt Wargon, who works at TerraPower and is the co-program chair for the Young Members Group. I am very, very grateful today for their help with moderating the Q&A session for this webinar, um, especially for such a large participation, and I'm very um, grateful for them uh, to help here. Now, without any further ado, let me introduce our first panelist, Harsh Desai, who is a senior manager at the Nuclear Energy Institute, where he is responsible for financial modeling, economic impact, policy development, business strategy, and data analytics. Harsh is the lead for the Nuclear Innovation Week, um, an annual week-long program in Washington, D.C., and if you haven't attended it before, I highly recommend it. Uh, in his previous role at the Department of Energy, he was an advisor to the Technology to Market Director, focused on commercializing clean energy technologies through innovative programs and partnerships between the national labs and private industry. Harsh's past roles include consultant to general manager and directors of the Naval Nuclear Labs Legislative Advisor to the senior uh, U.S. Senator during his 2014 ANS Congressional Fellowship, senior nuclear energy at Knowles Atomic Power Lab, and uh, nuclear engineer at GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy. He has an MBA from New York University's Stern Business School, along with a bachelor's and master's of science from NC State University, Go Wolfpack. Uh, he is an active member of the American Nuclear Society and the current chair of the Young Members Group at ANS um, and the Congressional Fellowship Committee and the vice chair for the Finance Committee. Harsh enjoys going on adventures, chasing tornadoes carefully, being an avid photographer, traveling, and brewing a lot of beer. So with that, let me now turn to Harsh uh, to tell you a lot more about economics of nuclear power. Harsh? Good morning. Thank you very much for that introduction. First, first of all, I want to take a moment to thank you and all of ANS uh, for putting this on. This is a fantastic opportunity to talk a little bit about um, a topic that's uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, with that, I do want to say um, to everyone, please do take prudent measures to stay safe, uh, especially in this environment right now. Um, and especially thank you um, to all of you and your family members who are working on the front lines. Uh, we really do appreciate that. So with that, uh, let me kind of take a moment to give you an idea of what I'm going to talk about and then talk about it. Uh, at first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the electricity revenues um, and how that actually happens today. Um, next thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, the nuclear industry's costs and what are the trends that have been uh, in today and with current fleet. I will then move to talking a little bit about what does the future grid, uh, future of the grid looks like. Um, and you know, what might be you, uh, the nuclear's role there. And then finally, I will conclude by talking a little bit about uh, economics of uh, the, the future nuclear technologies. So with that, let me go ahead and turn into the first part, uh, talking a little bit about the revenue side of things. So 
The first part I want to talk a little bit about just highlighting how does the electricity actually get delivered to your house. Uh, once electricity is generated from a power plant, it is um, uh, distributed and transmitted and distributed by uh, a couple of means. Uh, they're all through independent system operators. Um, and there are two kinds of markets that we typically look at. Again, there's various different aspects of that, but for this point purpose, we'll keep it to uh, general. There is a regulated markets, which is where states compensate uh, the power generators for cost of electricity. And then there are uh, wholesale markets. They also go by competitive markets or deregulated markets. There's a lot of discussion on this. And again, I can probably teach an entire semester worth of course. Um, so we'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. The uh, independent system uh, operators, uh, you see some of them, including ERCOT, PJM, MISO, New England, and I'll focus the revenue discussion really on that point at the moment. So if you go to the next slide, Dan, uh, what you see here is that um, we treat elect electricity as a commodity. Um, all electrons are treated equally and only the ones that are price competitive, the cheapest, are really rewarded by uh, getting on the grid. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, another example of commodity might be oil. Uh, as you think, or rice, or s some of the other agricultural products. So with that, um, let me turn over here to the next slide to talk a little bit about where we have been in the electricity, declining electricity prices. So if you look at electricity right now, um, since 2005 to about now, you can see the electricity prices have declined significantly uh, over the years. There are many reasons for this, and you know certainly, there is lower electricity demand. There are falling natural gas prices, as we all know. And then certainly failure for markets to really recognize the attributes of some of these nuclear or uh, clean energy technologies. So with that, if you go to the next slide, Dan, let me kind of take a moment to kind of give you an idea how supply and demand aspects work here. Um, I want to highlight here that this is really building a marginal supply curve. So what does that mean? It's to get the next unit of electricity on the grid. So next a unit here would be megawatt hour or kilowatt hour, really the same thing, but uh, let's stick to megawatt hour. Um, the point here is what does it cost to put on the next megawatt hour of electricity on the grid? So if you see megawatts here on the x-axis and then dollars per megawatt hour on the y-axis. So what you see over here is that, I'm gonna start with wind, uh, wind usually because of the tax credits we do provide to wind and several other uh, reasons, wind power tends to be can uh, a bid into the market at negative prices um, and still at the end of the day make profit due to their uh, tax credits. Um, then you would see coal. Uh, coal tends to be cheaper here as well, primarily because of the, um, the, the cost of coal. And then you see natural gas here. There are two things for natural gases. One is the a combined cycle natural gas, and then again, uh, not as efficient uh, natural gas plants as well. Um, if you hit the next slide, Dan, one thing I wanna mention here is that the reason why nuclear doesn't show up on that marginal curve is because nuclear is a price taker. So in scenarios where you've got um, whatever the price is on the grid, that's what nuclear power plants will, will get. One caveat or a couple of caveats I will put here is that a lot of times our nuclear power plants bid into the future markets. So they will bid uh, it much further ahead, maybe six months, one year, two years, or up to three years in advance and sell their electricity. The reason for that is that's a surety. They get sure revenue at certain price that allows a lot of the power plants and certainly the companies to plan things ahead. Um, so that's why you don't see them on this, uh, on this uh, marginal uh, supply curve. So let's, let's kind of walk you through an example here. So what would a price be? So as you already see the supply curve here, let's say there is a demand at certain point. Um, we're all watching webinars uh, and that causes some kind of demand on the electricity grid. And you see that's sort of the demand. So at that intersection right there, supply and demand, you would see a certain quantity and accordingly certain price. So everyone on that left side would get uh, revenue uh, as they bid into the market. So in nuclear certainly would get that revenue of P, whatever that dollar per megawatt hours is. 
So certainly everybody on the left side of the curve is happy that their electricity is taken on the grid and, and they generate revenue. And then the people on, uh, on the right side of the uh, curve are not happy because their electricity is not sold. So let's walk through another example. What happens in a scenario when um, natural gas prices fall? So you have currently have this supply curve. The supply curve certainly changes because of the price of natural gas is falling. So if you hit it one more time, Dan, uh, you would see that there is a new supply curve that now corresponds to a new price. And therefore, um, an, if the nuclear power plants are getting uh, revenue on real time or day head markets, that's what they would see as well. Now, this also has an impact in the longer term. If the natural gas prices are continuously falling and staying low, um, the future prices would certainly reflect that as well. So with that, now that's sort of an understanding. Let me move to the next slide and talk a little bit about um, where the costs have been. So what you heard a little bit about was the revenue, how these power plants generate revenue. So now if we talk a little bit about the cost side of the things, let me give you an idea how nuclear power plant costs are talked about. Usually we uh, break them up into three categories. One is capital, another is fuel, and then the third is operations. Operations is about 60% of the costs, capital is about 20% and fuel is also about 20%. So if you look at uh, the cost for 2019, they're about $30.42 per, 40, $30 per megawatt hour. Well, you're gonna ask me, well, what does that mean in rel relation to uh, what we've been in the past? Well, if you look on the right side, you certainly see that the costs in 2019, um, these preliminary costs in 2019 are lower than what the other uh, years have been. Matter of fact, I will tell you this, that since we've started collecting this data uh, since 2002, entire industry-wide data, these are the lowest costs that we've ever seen since 2002. Um, they may have been lower before um, or may not. We don't have good enough of data to have exact view of the entire industry. But regardless, since 2002, these are the lowest costs that we've seen. And, and we as all of us in the nuclear industry should take pride because there's a lot of work done anywhere from utilities, national labs, vendors, and everyone to get us to that point. So if you go to the next slide, Dan, I do wanna highlight something uh, that's called Delivering the Nuclear Promise. This was an initiative launched in 2015 to bring the cost of nuclear power down by 30%. And we wanna compare it to 2002 when there was the peak uh, all the way, in, and the goal was to get it down by 30% by the end of the decade. Well, here we are, we have done it. Uh, we've actually, matter of fact, reduced the cost by 32%. So this is another thing that we as an industry should be very proud of, that we've achieved, we've, we went out and said that we would reduce our costs and we've gone through and done that. And there are a lot of different ways we went about doing that. Um, we can talk about that later. So if you go to the next slide, Dan. So with that, let me turn to talking a little bit about what does this mean for the future? So I've kind of talked to you a little bit about where we are today, how we got to today, and what the trends have looked like today. Let's talk a little bit about the future. So as if you go to the next slide, Dan, uh, what you would see here is that, uh, as you have all heard um, and maybe paying attention to, a lot of utilities around the United States have been making carbon-free pledges or trying to get to a, a, a position in 2030, 40, or 50 to say that, hey, I will be net zero or I will be down to 10% of my carbon emissions or whatever that number may be. We at NEI have put this together and uh, what you see here are um, all the, all the uh, 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 utilities that have nuclear power plants looking at what their commitments are. These are publicly announced uh, 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 carbon pledges that they've said. And based on that, we put this graph together to kind of show you that where we are today to where we need to be in 2050. What you don't see here is um, about, if you look at today in 2019, there's about half more of uh, utilities that have not made any commitments. But these are the utilities that have made commitments and all the different colors um, uh, and even the, the, the gray at the bottom represent the utilities that have nuclear power plants. So these nuclear power plants are gonna help them achieve those commitments. Um, if you go to the next slide, what you would see here is that along the same line, the states themselves are also making commitments. Not only the utilities are saying that, hey, I'm listening to my customers, I'm listening to my investors, 
and I'm listening to a wide variety of uh, stakeholders saying that I need to reduce my emissions, but also the states themselves are doing so as well, whether they are doing it through um, some sort of uh, standards or providing tax credits or goals, whatever they may be, they're taking significant efforts to do so themselves as well. So what does that mean for us? So if you go to the next slide, Dan, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is, if you look at this, this, this chart, on the left side, what you see is where we are today. Um, electricity is traded, like I said, in these independent system operators uh, using the supply demand curve I talked about, but there are states that treat it a little bit differently. States like New York, Illinois, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, Ohio, um, they treat it a little bit differently, saying that, hey, if you generate clean electricity, clean carbon-free electricity, I'm going to give you a little bit of bump in revenue or reduce your tax burden or various different ways. Um, and you see that on the right side. How does that translate into energy source? So you see that um, certainly wind, solar, and other renewables do get tax benefits, so they, they show up on, on, on the clean side. Some of the nuclear power plants also receive clean energy credits, so you, they, see, they show up up there as well. But for most of the nuclear power plants, they do not. They are treated just like commodity, just like any other electricity generator. So if you look into the future and go to the next slide, what would that look like? So if I take that uh, uh, graph that I showed about utilities and I project that to 2050 and say, well, if clean energy is going to be compensated a little bit differently and we're going to be really looking at clean carbon-free electricity on the grid, well, the left side of that chart is what it might look like, where commodity is still traded, but the clean carbon-free gets traded a little bit differently. Well, what does that mean in terms of fuel sources? Well, certainly uh, you see at the bottom all the current uh, existing electricity sources, but you open up an entire new market for new clean sources. They could be anything from wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, hydro, anything that does not generate carbon emissions. But along with that, there's going, to be there's going to have to be a new market that's really called firm clean uh, uh, source, sources market. The, these are the sources that can run 24-7 and, uh, and, and be flexible in going up and down in power as needed. And this is exactly where nuclear fits in well, where nuclear can really go through and provide that benefit. So if you go to the next slide, I uh, just wanted to highlight that if you look on the left side, that tells you where we are today. If you look to the right side of that, what you would see is that if I take EIA's projections and say, late, look, I, we generate about 20% of the electricity. If I project it to 2050, how much more new nuclear we would need to put on the grid? That's about 90 gigawatts. Let's for some reason say that, hey, what if it's 33% of the electricity generation? That's another 90 gigawatts of nuclear capacity needing to be on the grid. And again, these don't account for some of the other so, uh, uh, sectors decarbonizing. So if we go to the next slide, Dan. So I wanna to touch base a little bit on what does this mean for the future of nuclear power plants? Um, I do wanna highlight that when we talk about future of nuclear power plants, I like to use the analogy of uh, different uh, products. So let's say iPhone. So I've got this iPhone. Uh, my significant other has a tiny iPhone called iPhone SE. Um, that's a smaller iPhone. And then certainly there are some people that have the giant iPhone, iPhone Max, or whatever that may be. And I'm sure cer certainly applies to other phone manufacturers as well. But the point here is that we get uh, the, the iPhones based on what you need. There are small iPhones, there are bigger iPhones, and then there are really big iPhones. That's the same sort of type of analogy applies here. We have technologies that are micro reactors, small module reactors, and certainly big uh, uh, reactors, uh, uh, baseload reactors. Again, these reactors supply the demand that is needed. Whatever the utilities may need, the cust customers may need, and again, whatever their, their interests are. So with that, let me talk a little bit about small modular reactors. So this was a study done by NEI a couple of years ago. Again, I will preface that the numbers here are two years old at this point, or almost two and a half years old. So the number on the left side is actually lower. Now, if I were in the middle of doing that study, and when I look at that number, it would be a lot lower now than it is uh, showing over there. So what this shows is the levelized cost of electricity, meaning if you start investing in a technology now, going through licensing, constructing, operating, and disposal, if you look at all of that cost and revenue and look at it in today's dollars, 
what would that dollars per megawatt hour look like? Well, for an SMR, that would be about $78 per megawatt hour. Again, it's looking a lot more like 50 to $60 per megawatt hour nowadays with, with a lot of improvements in the small modular reactor technologies and the companies that are working hard at it, like New Scale and GE um, and Holtec. So additional things that bring that cost down, production tax credits, uh, DOE's loan guarantees, and certainly tax benefits, depending on whether you're an investor-owned utility or uh, you are publicly owned uh, or, or a public owned utility, uh, you would see a significant tax benefit. And what you see next to it is the natural gas combined cycle power plant. So when you start thinking about it, these new, new SMRs are really cost competitive to these natural gas combined cycle uh, power plants. And our vendors are really working hard to get them down to that level. If you go to the next slide, what this shows here is really looking at what would the overnight capital cost would be. This means cost of building a, a nuclear reactor, and it's a dollar per kilowatt um, electric. So if it's a 300 megawatt plant, you certainly do a simple arithmetic to get an idea of what the overnight capital cost in today's dollars is. So the more we build, the lower the cost of each next SMR would be. So when you start looking at this, that yeah, we actually can reduce our overnight capital cost significantly the more we deploy SMRs. It's a, it's a concept, we all get it, but we're putting some numbers around it and telling you that, look, as you start building up to you know, uh, 10, 12, 16 reactors, you start seeing significant drop in your cost of electricity. So if you go to the next slide, um, what this again shows you is what if it's an investor owned utility like let's say Exelon or uh, Duke versus um, a, a municipalities uh, like Nebraska Power Project that owns Cooper uh, Nuclear Power Plant. There are differences in how the cost would be because of cost of uh, capital, cost of finance, those all get factored in. So when you start looking at it, these SMRs really do become very cost competitive to the next com competitor on the market, which would be natural gas combined cycle plant. So that's SMRs. Let me turn uh, to micro reactors. Um, there was a, a webinar a couple of weeks ago that talked a lot about it, so please go do watch it. It talks a little bit more about it, but I did want to put one slide in here that in the market that micro reactors would be serving, they are very competitive. Um, their competitor is diesel generators, and they are, they, our economics really tell us that they would be highly competitive in those markets. And then next slide, finally, um, I want to highlight the non-light water reactor, advanced reactor cost estimates. There are several papers that have written that talk a lot about where various different advanced nuclear companies are really aiming for their uh, technologies to be. Um, again, we don't know a lot because you know, we, we haven't gotten to a point where really doing deep analysis, but there's a lot of efforts going there. But these are our best estimates today showing that, look, compared to a conventional plant, that really would be cheaper and we can get them there. Um, if you go to the next slide, same thing shows a little bit differently. It shows capital, o and and fuel costs. Um, again, it shows you what, what, would be, what would it take to get those um, uh, uh, reactors built um, in a levelized uh, cost of electricity comparison. So with that, um, I will turn over a little bit and talk a little bit about various different financial mechanisms. Um, and that talks to you a lot about you know, private financing, federal support, and state support to get you the finance, financial support needed to get these reactors built into the future. And if you go to the next slide, that talks a little bit on the policy aspects as well. Really, we want states are taking actions in valuing the carbon-free electricity, um, and that will continue to take place, and we want them to continue to take place. That will help us lower financial costs, and certainly uh, if there are tax incentives that will additionally help our reactors be uh, even more uh, cost competitive uh, than, than I've talked about as well. So with that, I thank you very much for giving me this time and I turn it back to you, Ishida. Thank you, Harsh. That was very insightful and a very excellent introduction to nuclear economics. So much appreciated that. Let me just take a moment to let everybody know that these slides will be available after as the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we had quite a few questions about that. So yes, they will be available later to the recording. Um, and now let me take a moment to introduce our next panelist, uh, Scott Rasmussen from New Scale Power. Scott joined uh, New Scale Power as Director of Sales in September 2018 
primarily being responsible for all aspects of developing domestic and international customer partnerships to implement new scale small modular reactor power plant technology. Um, this followed an extensive career in GE Power and GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy, where he last held the position of Vice President in the PRISM product line, uh, the nuclear plant projects. In that role, Scott led uh, the establishment of the vision for commercial and market strategy and directed the product and technology development for PRISM product line. Prior to that role, Scott was the ESBWR Senior product, product Manager, as well as having held several other business critical positions within GE Hitachi. During his uh, time in GE's power division, Scott gained experience working with global power plant developers and utilities, and has supported numerous large projects, power projects in the United States, in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. Uh, he has also spent time in various engineering roles, leading positions in commercial operations, project management, and supply chain, to say the least. Scott holds a Master's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Union College and a Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace from New, New York Institute of Technology. With that, Scott, I will turn this over to you. Thank you. Um, Scott, I'm sorry, we're having some trouble hearing you, I believe. You're still on mute. Well, let's try that then. Uh, I tried to unmute my phone and tried to un unmute my computer at the same time. Hopefully that's working. Can you hear me now? Much better, thank you. All right, you're quite welcome. Uh, first of all, Ishida and Harsh, thank you for the uh, great introduction and thank you for teeing up this important discussion today. I'm certainly glad to be part of the ANS student webinar and series, we love supporting the conference. Um, both as an ANS member and with NewScale being an ANS uh, member as well. I hope everyone is healthy and safe and they're doing everything possible to remain that way. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit, uh, some of the things that Harsh brought up, I think are really critical in understanding what's important for the economics of nuclear technology as we go forward. Dan, if you can go to the next slide, please, I'd appreciate that. So this is a view of the new scale power module. And Dan, if you click again, because this is an animated version, you'll get to see where the module fits into the reactor building for a new scale power plant. Uh, Dan, if you can click again, you'll get to see the overall plant view. One of the reasons why I like to use this slide continually, and our marketing team's done a nice job with that, is to show how small the module actually is so that you can understand that it's completely factory fabricated, gets shipped to site, gets installed within the build in the reactor building, uh, coming in through the side, put together, and there uh, for our base design includes 12 new scale power modules. The beauty of that design is it provides for an opportunity to not just provide clean electricity, but clean energy for a multitude of purposes. And that I think is a key to understanding the value of nuclear energy as we go forward. It's not just about electricity, it's about clean energy to support multiple needs at a given moment at a given time. And I feel that's where the nuclear industry is heading and understanding how to get there. I feel, also feel that New Scale is leading that path. And you can see in our design below the overall plant layout, it's a small footprint. It's 35 acres, approximately 14 hectares, which provides for putting a plant in almost any vicinity and any, um, in really any location. Next slide, please. This helps understand the value chain of really being able to produce a plant. And as Harsh was saying on the one slide with LCOEs uh, really coming down quickly for SMRs, that the plant can be, excuse me, the primary components are factory fabricated. They're shipped to site. Um, for the new scale power module, it just gets bolted together within the building, um, installed, and you can actually start generating electricity in a sequential element. First module comes, uh, gets installed, Go through, it goes through a test setup and that becomes commercial operational while the other modules are being installed. That's also part of the value chain for new nuclear, being able to get to market and get installed and generate revenue as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. Now I mentioned before about the ability to deliver clean energy at a given moment, um, particularly with new scales design, you can do that at the same time for multiple industries. So I can support a desalination plant, a hydrogen plant, and an oil refinery at the same time, while also providing 
critical power for mission critical facilities. Um, with New Scale's operational flexibility, we can also easily integrate with wind, solar, and other, in, and other energy sources. That, I think, is part of the power. I don't want to overuse the word power, but that's part of the secret of being able to deliver on also on the nuclear promise. It's not just about lower cost. It's about, it's about providing different energy levels at the same time. I don't want to chew up um, Eric's time, and I know there's going to be a lot of questions, so I'll end there, and we can talk about particular economic details of new scale design as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, you know, one my one takeaway is it's not about uh, electricity. It's really about clean energy. Um, I think that's going to stick with me for a while. So let me now introduce our next panelist, um, Dr. Eric Lowen from GE Hitachi, uh, who will talk about the economics of prison reactors, say the least, amongst much more. Eric? Thank you. So the first, before my slides get are getting put up, I would like you to remember two sets of numbers. One is the series of two and three, and the other one is the number one and ten. And those will help you as we talk about advanced reactors. So the next slide shows a reactor that operated in the Idaho desert called Experimental Breeder Reactor Number Two that was there to commercialize the technology of fast spectrum reactors. So that's the goal, I think, for, for me in my career is to see this advanced technology in the fast spectrum being produced. And the commercial variant of that was done during the Advanced Liquid Metal Reactor Program with a reactor that was called, was called PRISM. First, if we look at the water-cooled reactors that Hirsch described and Scott described, they typically produce two neutrons per fission. In a fast spectrum reactor here, we have three. So again, the two numbers you need to remember are how many neutrons we get per fission, two versus three. The other number is one versus 10. In a water-cooled reactor, typically the, the neutron travels about one centimeter before it gets absorbed or causes another fission, where in a fast spectrum reactor, it goes 10 centimeters. So in that context, it has a little bit more mobility and the core dynamics are different. So when we look at the aviation industry, we started it with propellers. They were slow and what we're looking at, and now we've moved to jet engines that can fly to you know, 13,000 miles on the airplane I see the future of nuclear power as heading into these fast spectrum so that we get more neutrons per fission and we have different fuels that we can use because of the neutron path links. So the next slide shows what is PRISM. It's this particular commercial variant is two reactors side by side on a seismic isolation pad. And then it has a, you see a cutaway of the reactor vessel. And this is, a slide that shows the key to this reactor is on the very far right hand side that uses metallic fuel that goes into the reactor vessel that shows the fuel goes from the multicolor that saw on the right to just being solid green into this reactor vessel. The next slide shows the power extraction cycle. What's unique about when you head to fast spectrum and it's not necessarily you need fast spectrum, you could be with salt cooled reactors, lead cooled reactors, is that you have the ability to go from typically 300 degrees C to 500 degrees C. So you can go into the range of superheated steam. And this is typically what our competitors are doing in the fossil industry of both coal and of combined gas. Next slide shows. The economics of a fast spectrum, and this is to the theme of, of why we're here today. One of the features of this particular reactor design, it's called a pool type, which means that the entire primary coolant is housed in one reactor vessel and it has a guard vessel that's around that. And that means you can eliminate the accident called a loss of coolant accident. There are other designs that have done that in the water cooled space also. And in that context, to eliminate the loss of coolant accident is a significant gain for our safety because the safety of nuclear power, I would I say, is the three C's just like IAEA. You have to control the reaction, you gotta cool it, and you gotta contain it. So if you don't have to worry about losing the coolant, it's easy to cool and remove that decay heat. Next is metallic fuel. Metallic fuel has been tested in the reactors of experimental breeder reactor number one, two, and the fast flux test facility. This metallic fuel is easy to fabricate and it gives you this passive shutdown, meaning that as the temperature increases, it reduces the power. 
The next is the higher operating temperature, you get improved steam cycle efficiency. If you get steam better efficiency, you're gonna have more revenue. The fast vision gives you higher fuel utilization. Round numbers, a water-cooled reactor uses 1% of the available energy that's in uranium, where if you move to a fast spectrum, you can approach 99% of that. The higher power density of a sodium-cooled reactor or other advanced reactors allows that footprint to be smaller. That footprint includes both the nuclear island of how much concrete or how much steel you're using and also to the yard. Passive safety eliminates active systems that you don't have to purchase or do maintenance on. And then the modular design where you're building on site is what helps drive the economics because it's that construction certainty and doing it in a rapid manner to where you can rely on a supply, ch supply chain to where you're assembling on site is gonna drive better economics for the plant to get on in operation. So that's my last slide. And I'll turn over to you, Sheeta, to Thank you. moderate the questions. Thank you. So before I do that, I realized I didn't properly introduce Dr. Lowen. So let me take a step back and give you some background about Dr. Eric Lowen and his area of expertise. Uh, he has worked for 35 years at the intersection of nuclear science and technology in nuclear Navy nuclear waste processing at a national laboratory and uh, now as chief consulting engineer in advanced plants at GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy in Wilmington, North Carolina. He is also the chair for senior industry advisory panel at the Generation 4 International Forum. Uh, Eric has served as the American Nuclear Society's 2005 Congressional Fellow, working in the office of Senator Chuck Hakel. Prior to that, in 1999, Eric joined Idaho National Laboratory, where he contributed towards development of Generation 4 lead business cooled reactor. He was the director of molten metal uh, technology in the Fall River, Massachusetts, this is mouthful for me, <laughs> and has served um, in, for 10 years in the U.S. Navy. Um, thank you for that, Eric. Uh, he has also served as the president for American Nuclear Society. During his career, Eric has received several awards, including 2018 NAYGN uh, Continental Sensei Award, the Presidential Citation and Young Members Advancement and Public Communication uh, Awards for the American Nuclear Society, the Outstanding Mentor and Outstanding Education Volunteer of the Year Awards of the Department of Energy um, uh, from U.S. government. Uh, currently, Eric has 18 issued patents. He received his bachelor's in chemistry and math with a minor in physics from Western State College and a master's of science in nuclear engineering and a PhD in engineering physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So with that, now you have a little more, more background and context to his presentation. Um, and now let me turn over to Q&A because we have quite a few questions coming in already. So um, first one looks like it's for you, Harsh. Um, it's a very well-formulated question, so I will just read it as is. Uh, it goes, um, according to the NEI News, November 6, 2018, the average 2018 generating costs for existing nuclear plants was 33.5 megawatt hour per dollar, uh, per hour, sorry, uh, where the levelized generating cost of the new gas-fired plants, which would be needed to replace shut, uh, shut down nuclear plants, was $48 megawatt uh, per hour. Uh, do you have a more recent generating cost for nuclear and a more recent levelized generating cost for new, for new gas-fired plants? Sure, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, so what I would tell you is that, first of all, uh, from 2018 to 2019, our nuclear generating costs did decrease. Um, and as you can see, it decreased by 8% or so. So that's a significant uh, decrease in itself. Um, now, when we start looking at our generating costs today of assets that have already been built, they're already generating, some costs already been included, um, these are just costs of operating the power plant. So that's what the generate, total generating costs are. So 30, that's what $32 per megawatt hour is. Now, if you're asking about what a levelized cost of electricity of building a new uh, natural gas power plant, that's a little bit of a different story. Um, but for as many of you know, when you do build a, new, a, a natural gas power plant, most of the cost, almost 80% of the cost goes into the fuel, which is your natural gas fuel. Um, so you can kind of get a pretty good idea of where the cost of the fuel is just by looking at, at, at where natural gas costs are. And I showed the, 
the, the cost curve earlier today. And that's a very, sim very simplified version of that as well. Now, specifically to answer your question on what uh, would a cost of new uh, plants would be, EIA, the US Energy Information Administration, does put out every year levelized cost of electricity. Uh, it's, it's a small white paper that they put out. Uh, it's on their website. I just checked it out. Uh, it's, it's open. Uh, they just put it in, in February timeframe. So if you just look for it, EIA, LCOE costs, you'll find the cost in there. Thank you. Um, the next question that I have here, it looks like Scott can shed some light on it. Um, the question goes, we know nuclear energy can provide us carbon-free electricity. What do you say are some of the most critical issues in introducing nuclear power for mitigating environmental degradation? Scott, I believe you're on mute again. We'll try that again. <laughs> I wasn't on mute, but I hit mute and unmute just to make sure we're clear. Um, so I started to say before during my the brief discussion was that I think the value of nuclear energy is to be able to provide multiple clean energy uh, as a source for multiple clean energy uses. And I think the way to mitigate the impact on, I think to, to be able to mitigate that is to be able to support multiple functions at the same time. One of the key issues that we're seeing in certain markets is the ability to provide heat for district heating. And that means you've got to be able to have a plant that can be close enough to the point of use and small enough that you're not taking up a large footprint and creating a problem by trying to solve a problem. So I hope that answered the question, but I think that's a focal, a focal point is being able to provide the technology to deliver multiple needs, oh, excuse me, to su support multiple needs. Absolutely. Uh, I think that addresses the question very well. Thank you. Um, we have one more question here, um, and I think this one is more up your alley, Eric. Uh, can you address the estimated cost shakeout of SMR and if, of if SMR NSS can build modular units in a factory in a plug and play approach to construction regardless of the fuel type? I would refer our listeners to there's a great MIT report that talked about the cost of nuclear power, and I had the the opportunity to talk to Jacopo Bongiorno, who's the chair of that department. And he said, we should stop squabbling about technologies. It's all about construction. So that report showed that the construction, that the big capital cost drivers are coming from the construction. And we got need to look at innovative ways of how to reduce that. Modular construction does that. Factory ship shipping does that. And also innovative ways to do excavation at the site so you minimize that. So it isn't a five-year jobs program. It's we need to set this power plant because those people in that region need electricity. And so that's where the economics, I think, our focus should be rather than what's the nifty gadget that we have is how do you shorten that construction time scale? And I will wholeheartedly um, agree with Eric on that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but wholeheartedly agree with that, that the bigger problem with uh, cost of implementation is the construction. It's not the technology. Great. While we're on the topic of SMRs, um, I believe this is both Scott and Eric's alley. What are the biggest hurdles for connecting SMRs to the energy grid in the United States? Being able to integrate with the influx of renewables and having the technology that can uh, manage that. I would say we got to make sure that the different, we know SMRs scale well, that you're buying less steel, but less concrete and those sort of things. So it makes sense economics. The economics that we need NEI and Hirsch to help us on is some things that currently are not scaling with being small. And that's how do you get your license? How much do you pay a year for your license? How many security people do you need? What's your emergency protection zone around that particular area? And when I was president of the ANS, there was an SMR committee working, a special committee working on that to try to figure out those five areas that they couldn't see scalability to help the economics. So there's some previous work that ANS has done in that area. And if you don't mind, I'll add a couple of things here. You know, this, this is a, I'll take a broad answer to this question, which is that there's two aspects of that. How do you increase the revenue and decrease the sort of the cost aspect of that? So I think both of the speakers actually mentioned that. 
As far as the revenue side of things, I think, you know, as we look into the future, as I mentioned earlier, it will be valuable to have a very good idea of how technologies, all carbon-free technologies like nuclear and uh, uh, wind and solar and geothermal, how they're actually being compensated for that attribute. Um, everyone, it seems like that a lot of uh, folks are really interested in having carbon-free uh, electricity um, gen uh, provided at their house. So if that's the case, then we have to find a way to get us to that point. Um, the markets, the way they are, um, they really are designed to, to provide and make sure that uh, the lowest form of electricity is delivered on the grid. Uh, so if there, is, if there is a desire to move away from that and, uh, and value the attributes like clean energy and firm and reliable 24 seven, then we have to have a mechanism to get us to that point. So that's the revenue side. And then the cost side, uh, exactly what Dr. Owen mentioned is, is finding ways so that we can differentiate ourselves a little bit differently and put ourselves on a playing field um, so that you know we are talking about uh, nuclear at the same on the same level field as all the other technologies as well. Thank you, um, Harsh. While we have you on the spot here, I have a question that relates very well to the previous question that was addressed to you. Um, the question says that it is noted in a 2018 benchmarking that the average operating budget for a U.S. nuclear power plant was about 231 million dollars. Do you have a more current average operating budget? Well, that's oddly specific question. Uh, happy to answer that. But uh, what I would tell you is that let's take a step back and, and you saw the numbers there. We saw a significant drop year over year. So you can calculate that um, down. Now, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. You're saying dollars per, per plant. Um, I would recognize that we have actually had uh, two power plants in 2019 uh, retired prematurely due to various reasons. Um, so that may have an impact on the cost, but if you're talking about uh, operating costs per plant, you know, it would go from you know, anywhere from 230, this is just the operations part, so anywhere from 230 to $250 million per plant. Again, let me preface it by saying that it changes variably, it, var it varies significantly depending on the plant you are, whether you have a single unit, multi-unit plant, uh, where you're located, um, whether you're in regulated, deregulated markets. So, you know, one number should not be able to, you should not look at one number and just say, well, that tells a story. It doesn't. There's a lot of qualifiers there. I'm happy to have that discussion anytime separately um, with that. So that, I'll end there. Thank you. Um, Scott, it looks like I have a direct question for you here. Um, can you speak to the capital cost of nuclear compared to the expected revenue or profit over a lifetime of a new scale plant? I'm going to follow up with Harsh's comments too about that the you know lifetime revenue that really is dependent upon overall operation and the operational model of the plant owner and operator. So I'm not going to touch on that too much, but I would like to focus perhaps on the uh, capital cost and the driving factor in that. So uh, and factors for that. So with new scale, we're really targeting for an nth of a kind, which is not the first of a kind. It's the uh, so multiple down the line of a kind, taking advantage of your manufacturing capability and lessons learned during construction and the innovations that Dr. Lowen, Dr. Lowen referred to before. But we're targeting about a $3,600 per kilowatt value for an nth of a kind. That's a target at this point. And this is where we are based upon our cost analysis, the, the depth of design that we've gotten to, and you know, including some of the, uh, the cost for getting our design licensed, which by the way, is on target for this year. So I want to bring that up. Um, but when you take a look at that, when you see that picture and you understand that this is the cost now and what is the expected revenue as we go forward, well, some of the things that Harsh leaned on before was it's about the value and what the value of the market is seeing for that clean energy and what they're willing to pay for it. So I, in, in general terms, that's how it lines up. So I don't want to say this is where it, this is where we think it'll be for our technology. However, I, brought, I want to bring up something that I heard from a CEO of a plant opera, of a uh, utility, a major utility. I was at an event and he brought up the conversation that looking at capital cost in an LCOE today for a nuclear plant is nice to have that discussion and nice to have those numbers, but the real value is understanding that the payback is relatively short. And that asset, the plant itself, is, a value, is um, really a revenue generator for 60 to 100 years. 
So if you can pay for that plant in less than 10, which is where we're all targeting significantly less than 10 years, and you've got revenue from that asset for 100 years, that's incredible. I want to leave you with that thought. Incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Eric, I believe this question is um, more directed to you since it's, all about, since it's talking about DE, GE and the VTR. The question says that understanding GE is working with Department of Energy on the uh, VTR utilizing the PRISM design. Can you explain whether or not this will help demonstrate the design and get it closer to commercial, commercialization, even though the VTR will be a user facility? The Department of Energy selected the PRISM technology as the baseline technology for the versatile test reactor. It came about from a study that they did to see which technology was the most advanced to be able to make a test reactor from. And that particular study was led by Tom O'Connor and he put a whole bunch of people in the room from different companies, different entities, and we all had to rate the technologies and had to agree to the numbers by consensus. And out of that, the two technologies that were deemed the closest to be able to make a test reactor were sodium cool technology or a gas cool technology. And the rest of them, the, the group of people assembled, and I was one of them in the room that viewed the other sort of technologies couldn't do that. So that sodium fast reactor SFRs then became the technology of choice. Then as they started exploring what should the versatile test reactor to be, should it be a one-off design of a sodium fast reactor or should we leverage the 10 years of government funding during the advanced liquid metal reactor program? They chose to do that and GE along with Bechtel is supporting Battelle Energy Alliance who is running the Idaho National Laboratory to build the next test reactor in this nation called the Versatile Test Reactor. Stay tuned for more. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I see a question here that sort of falls under um, all your umbrellas. Uh, the question is, how does the potential for license renewal fit into the calculations for LCOE for, nuclear, uh, for new nuclear? Does the number typically include a 40-year license or is there flexibility for extensions to a 60 years or beyond? Well, I'll, I'll give you an answer here. I mean, that's an oddly specific question. So the specific answer to that is it really depends on the uh, designer of that asset. So you have certainly have cer certain assets that are being designed for 60 year plant life. They're really going for that 60 year license and then some maybe 40. Uh, so it really depends on what they are designing the plant for. I'll, I'll leave it to Scott and Eric to talk specifics if they want to. I'll, I'll take that one from a big holistic standpoint. Hoover Dam was built during the depression. And that dam, having read some of the historical documents, never talked about a life cycle or anything like that. If you go tour the Hoover Dam today and ask any one of the tour people, what is the design life of the Hoover Dam? They will all say 2000 years, which is fairly biblical to me. I don't know where they got that particular number. So I feel that in our industry, we were very conservative when we put our first nuclear power plants on line. We said, we're just gonna do a license for 40 years and then look at it again. Similar to doing a car license for um, people that they have 10 years, we gotta check your eyes again to make sure everything's all right. So it seems that some of our people that don't like nuclear power is using these license renewable renewals as a way to say, it was only designed for 40 years. I can't believe you're running this thing for 60 years or 80 years. This is a wonderful asset to make electricity. It's clean energy. And if the regulatory agency and the owner view that it still should be operated, I think we should continue with those uprates. And that helps us um, as a nation and helps us from a carbon-free standpoint and helps us as the industry. Scott, I'll give you the final word. Thank you, Eric and Harsh, and I can't disagree with anything either one of you has said. And Eric, I know we've had that conversation before. A 40-year license doesn't mean 40-year life. It means that's what the agreement was, and it was a conservative, conservative and intelligent approach. You can't, can't argue with it. I've seen some recent comments that there's no reason why many of these, many of the existing plants really can't be licensed uh, to be able to operate to 100 years and beyond. And I mentioned that 100 years earlier. So I, it's not necessarily built into the LCOE. I go back to it's a view of the overall capital cost review. How much does it cost to build the plant and how long am I gonna have that asset? 
And to a certain degree, I don't think too many utilities really worry about the payback period for the plant because they know they're going to have that asset providing clean energy for the longest period of time. And it's a generational technology. It's not, you think about it, for 100 years, it's just, it's, it's kind of amazing. So I'll leave the thought with, this is more about creating technology that can outlast all of us and provide, provide the energy for the future. Thank you. Um, it looks like I have time to squeeze in one more question, and this is one that I think really sums up today's um, panelists and their expertise. The question goes, policy is clearly a factor towards strengthening in the future of nuclear development. What should the policy be focused on? That's a loaded question, I guess. Uh, I'll take first stab at it, and then I will let my panelists uh, answer there as well. Um, I think the first of all, I do want to give a, a shout out to our appropriators in the United States Congress. They've done a lot of hard work in, in realizing that, look, nuclear will have to be a piece of the puzzle going, piece of the pie going forward. So you're seeing significant increase in, in the nuclear energy's budget, um, and that has allowed us to uh, move forward with demonstration aspects, VTR, um, all kinds of research um, and industry awards to really kind of move us in that direction to getting these technologies to demonstrated and deployed um, into the commercial market. And that, in, you know, that goes for anywhere from micro reactors to SMRs um, and, and non-water uh, advanced reactors as well. So what I would say here is that I think the policy is really you know, several fold. One is um, on the federal level, let's make sure that we can figure out a way to get these technologies into the marketplace. And there's a lot of hard work that's going on. National labs are doing their job as well. Um, and you know, one, one specific example I would tell you in the last couple of years that have come about is, how do we take my current nuclear power plants that are operating and finding a way to add additional revenue? Um, one thing specifically is hydrogen. We've got uh, a lot of, uh, of uh, utilities and DOE working on actually taking that asset and making it flexible so you can generate hydrogen as a fuel source for trucks and uh, a transportation sector. So that's, a, that, that's another value added. So that's one piece. And then the state side of things, let's continue pushing forward and finding ways to make sure that we devalue nuclear. Uh, and there are many different mechanisms for doing that. And I would recommend our uh, listeners to really take a look at what Illinois, New York, uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, and uh, Ohio did, just to kind of get an idea of what are the different mechanisms you can go after on that front. With that, I'll turn it over to the panel. Nuclear power has a supply chain. It's the front end that digs things up, makes fuel. The middle is the operation and construction of the plant. And then the back end is the third part of that. If you look at nuclear policy that started in 1946, amended in 1954, uh, 1983, 1987, 1992, and 2005 Energy Policy Acts, all of those allow commercialization in the first two buckets, in the fuel side and in the reactor operations. What I think from a policy standpoint is commercializing, get industry involved in the back end. Yeah, Eric, you just hit on something that I, the path I was going to go down. What I'd like to see from policy going forward, I think we've made great strides recognizing the value of nuclear energy as it compares to other sources of energy, seeing it as a clean energy source, not just, you know, not just wind and solar as renewables being the only clean energy sources. And I think what would really benefit the U.S. in the global marketplace is for policy to help support the overall supply chain to get our technologies really well developed and implemented in the U.S. and globally. We're losing ground to other countries that I won't mention. And realistically, they're not better. They're just more aggressive and they're just better supported. We need to do a better job of that to support all of us. Thank you. Um, I think we are run at, we've run out of time here. So um, I would like to thank all of you and the participants, the panelists for joining today. What a dynamic discussion. I think we had a ton of excellent questions. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but feel free to find the panelists, you know, chase them down and ask some questions later. <laughs> um, but um, I also hope that you will join us next week for culminating the student design competition. 
which was uh, generously sponsored by the ETWDD and YMG section of the uh, American Nuclear Society. Uh, this competition is focused towards providing undergraduate students from various universities to come together and pitch their senior design projects that they have been working on so hard for the past year and had to forego the opportunity to present due to cancellation of the student conference um, in, in light of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, so if any of the participants are watching, the finalists will be selected uh, this weekend and you'll be notified via email on April 5th with more information on the uh, competition. Secondly, I also want to mention the April 15th webinar coming up um, on uh, INL, um, it's called Spotlight on the National Labs. This time the focus will be on Idaho National Lab. It will be moderated by Catherine Pratt, who generously agreed to help me moderate today's Q&A session. So please do tune in for that. And thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you stay safe and healthy. Please take care and see you in the upcoming weeks. Bye, everybody.